please join me as we have our call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders build has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever.
you to stand with me and for our invocation. Father in heaven, this morning it is our desire to lift high the cross of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In him we offer you all praise and honor and glory, for by his death and resurrection you have set us free. So send your Spirit down among us that we might see your face, and by beholding you become changed into your likeness. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number 560, Let All Things Now Living.
We welcome you to the Vallejo Diet Church this morning. We're delighted you could be with us to share this time of worship. We're going to welcome uh, Mark Hussey to the organ this morning. Appreciate him uh, filling in for us uh, today and next week. You'll be able to hear him again when he's here. I'd like to have you take a look at the bulletin. This afternoon at 3.30 is the memorial service for Irma Torres here in the chapel. Tomorrow, the ladies' tea in, in the fellowship hall. And uh, we want to thank the Kelly and Marina for the special job they did with the kids as well. There are a number of announcements to take note of. Uh, on Friday evening, Praxis is going to be meeting upstairs in the fellowship hall next Friday evening. I'd like to, at this time, invite to the pulpit Lad Thomas, John St. Marie, and Liz Rembold. By the way, we're honoring Liz today for her 29 years of being the organist here at the Loyal Drive Church. She's the longest tenured employee that we have had at our church. And after the service today, we have a very special little uh, meal. In fact, it's probably a pretty big meal. <laughs> I took a look at it. You, that's a wonderful goodies to share uh, after the service, and so we'll be able to uh, uh, fellowship and, and give you a chance to talk with Liz. But as Liz began her uh, ministry uh, playing in churches uh, 20, excuse me, 58 years ago, and during the 29 years she's been here at the Vallejo Drive Church, she has played for over 1,150 worship services. Uh, 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 accompanied 2,300 congress uh, congregational hymns, 2,300 choir anthems, 3,400 organ solos, in addition to the 29 Christmas programs. <laughs> it's going to take a while to get used to someone else, isn't it? <laughs> well, she's invested long hours in preparation. I think. Most of you have no idea the amount of hours it, it took each week for Liz to prepare. Uh, I think uh, probably anywhere from 12 to 20 hours a week of preparing to play for us, including getting up at 3.45 on Sabbath morning to drive from Simi to be here over the last number of years uh, to provide to be able to practice at 7 a.m. in the morning. So today we want to say thank you for your service to us, for inspiring us and lifting us up with your music and blessing us. I want to start with Lad, if I may, Liz, oh, sure. okay? I want to introduce to you Lad Thomas. Uh, Lad Thomas is the, uh, uh, actually, the, uh, he is the uh, chair of the organ department at USC, her professor. But many of you, a few of you, I should say, know him because for 10 years, he shared the organ bench with Liz every other week. His lovely wife, Cherry Rose, is with us. These two individuals have both been in our, uh, honored internationally with Lifetime Achievement Awards for the Organist Guild. And for him, who is, uh, who is the organist for 58 years at our sister church here in town, our, our fellow Methodist church here in town, guess who we had for his backup organist over 30 years? Liz Rimbold. Now that says something about the quality in, of her music and the respect that they have for it. Lad, share a few words with us. Thank you, Mark. It's wonderful to be back here with so many of you and to be here today, Liz, to honor you for the terrific ministry and work that you have had, not only in this place, but throughout so much of the country. And you have really served so beautifully and so well and so meaningfully to so many people. One of the things that struck me here during our 10 years was the email address of this church, graceunconditional.com. I truly learned the meaning of unconditional love when I was privileged for 10 years to be in this place with all of you and together we were in ministry together. And Liz, I wanna thank you so much 
for the invitation to come here and work with all of you. That was when Liz and Darwin, you know, Darwin was always going somewhere, and they moved up to Hanford, and Liz said, I just can't drive that every week. Would you help me for a couple of months? And two months stayed in the 10 wonderful years. And you know, this idea of unconditional love, central to our theology, isn't it? And it was central, and it is central, to Liz's life, because that is how she has ministered to all of us. Liz, you've done this with a beautiful, unconditional love. And I saw this very clearly when we first met, and I had the privilege of offering some suggestions as a teacher of organ for this beautiful lady. And she came with a love of music that was contagious. I was bitten at that point. And it was absolutely contagious and beautiful. And she was diligent. She worked hard. She was determined. She was devoted. She gave of herself. And I always thought, Liz, you're going to have a beautiful ministry with this music because you love it so much. And that love is unconditionally given. And you just were always just there with the love of and seeking to fully understand what the composer was saying to us, what they were wanting us to understand, what they were wanting us to give. And it was about the music. It was not about yourself. And that is the most beautiful thing, isn't it? When we pour ourselves into this beautiful gift that has been given to us by composers. And a second thing that stands to me so much about Liz is her willingness to get in there for what she believes. She never hesitated, and she always came with absolute conviction. She studied, understood, and then she came with conviction. And this marvelous organ that you have in this church that can sound so beautifully with these wonderful floor surfaces and the other things acoustically. As you sing together, as you do liturgy together, you hear each other. You are a community through this. And Liz was a major player with her convictions and knowledge about how to make this place so it was a beautiful space for everything that occurs in here. Liz, a tremendous, word of appreciation and gratitude for you, for your fearless, untiring leadership. And then we would say one other thing. There's so many I could say, but this after all is a service. Um, Liz, it's your true friendship. You are a loyal person. You are a giving person. You are a friend. You are a colleague. You always were, to me, a wonderful colleague. This idea of student and teacher that quickly, quickly, quickly evaporated. And I said, we have here, I have here, a wonderful colleague for life. And this is the way our wonderful relationship manifests itself here, working together those 10 years. It was absolutely fantastic. And there was a time that I decided it was interesting to visit a surgeon, and I needed six months off over at Methodist Church. And this was sort of like a week before Christmas. And my wife called Liz and told her what was going on. Without a hesitation, Liz jumped in. She took over, and I was totally at peace about how things were going to be. And for six months, she took care of everything that needed taking care of. So she was here with you on Saturdays, and she was with the Methodists on Sundays. A very devoted and long weekend. And Liz, I will always appreciate so deeply what you've done. And other times when we've been gone, Liz is there. And it's just not going to be the same anymore being gone. But I just wish you much love and 
gratitude and appreciation and know that you have some wonderful days of excitement here with this choir and being in this beautiful congregation with these people. I love you dearly and with deepest gratitude, thank you. One of the works of the organist is to accompany the choir, and John St. Marie will share some thoughts on that. I came about five and a half years ago to sub for Brenda Moore, who was here at the time, and I didn't know that she was leaving. Um, and this is the first time I met Liz Rumble. And she was so enthusiastic and so such a beautiful, warm heart from the very beginning. And when I finished the rehearsal, she came up to me and just was so enthusiastic and so excited about um, what she thought I brought out in the music. And I was so impressed by her and by her playing. It was a really an amazing uh, morning. And I was so fortunate to be able to be called here and to worship with you every week. Um, when I started my first Sabbath, you know, we always have the choirs uh, retreat where we start to prepare the Christmas music. So Liz and I had worked for a while to choose the music. And in my first uh, rehearsal, I put something in front of her that was in all multimeters, and it was really tough to play. And I had, I had performed it before with other people. And they all had trouble with the same page every time. And no matter how f hard we worked at it, uh, it never seemed to line up very well. And a testament to Liz, the very first time we went through it, it was perfect. It was, and, and I, I've never experienced that again, except for in the concert that year. Um, she just brings such a dedication and professionality to what she does every week. She takes it so seriously, and it's so meaningful to her. She puts in, as, as Mark said, so many hours of practice, and she chooses each piece with such thoughtful devotion because she wants to make um, services here a worshipful space. And she's done this for 29 years. She has been, excuse me, a wonderful collaborator. Someone who has inspired me. And I just thank you for all you've given us here at Ed Vallejo for all these years. Amen. That's all I can say. morning. I was never nervous when I played the organ for you. However, I am not a great public speaker, so I will read my thoughts. I want to thank everyone involved in this lovely retirement recognition. I also want to thank the congregation for all of your support to the music department and me over the past 29 years. I could not have played for you for 29 years without your support, the support of the pastoral staff, the choir directors, and finally the choir. I have enjoyed every Sabbath and special program. I never minded commuting long distances. For over 10 years, I drove from Hanford, California, just south of Fresno. For seven years, I drove from Santa Maria, just south of San Luis Obispo. And for the past 12 years, I commuted from Simi Valley. I will desperately miss playing the organ, but I look forward to singing in the choir. Vin Scully, famed Dodger announcer, on his last broadcast after 67 years stated, don't be sad that it is over, be glad that it happened. I'm very glad that the last 29 years happened.
have this plaque that we will give Liz to hang on her wall at home. I'll read it to you. Award of Excellence, presented by the Vallejo Drive Church of Seventh-day Adventists to Elizabeth Rambolt for 29 years of enhancing our worship experience with outstanding musical presentation. You have blessed us with inspiring organ and piano accompaniment, uplifting preludes and rousing postludes that revitalize our spirits. We thank you for the long hours of preparation, your regular weekly faithfulness, and the excellent musical contributions that you have played for our church family. Thank you. There's another little gift that we oh. hope that you can do something nice with. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Slip this you. back in. That's beautiful. Okay. You want to keep it here or you want to take it with you? No, I have okay. a wall in my music room. Okay. Yeah, thank right. you. Oh, okay. They want to get a picture here. Oh. Thank you. Okay, the children's choir will bless us with some music now. So kids who aren't already up here, go ahead and come on down, and adults, uh, you can greet each other at this time. Good morning, everybody. 
Can you come closer? Amy, can you come closer? Because I want to show you everybody something. I want all of you to see it. Can you see what I have in my hand? Can somebody tell me what he is? Alenia. A chef. A chef. How can you tell he's a chef? Uh, he has a chef coat and hat. He has a chef coat and hat. Okay, let me give you guys another one. What is this one? Okay. A fire. <laughs> a fireman. Okay. How can you tell he's a fireman? Claire? Because he's wearing a fireman suit and a fireman hat. And a fireman hat. Yes, he's wearing a fireman hat and a fireman suit. Hold on, I'm gonna look for one more. Uh oh, I have a problem. <laughs> okay, I was supposed to have one dressed up like a king, but I think I forgot him. Can you guys help me out? What would a king be wearing? Let me see. A crown. A crown, definitely. What else? Damon? A, a, a very majestic robe. Majestic, bro. That was a good word. Yes, right? He would be wearing something really fancy, maybe gold, right? A gold crown. And he would look very majestic. I love that word. So, a long, 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 long time ago, there was a king coming to Jerusalem. And all the people run and said, hey, he's coming. Let's go greet him. And they all lined up by the road where the king was coming in. And when they looked at the king, the king was not wearing a crown. And he was not wearing a majestic robe. He was wearing the same clothes that maybe a fisherman would wear, and no crown. And maybe, what would a king drive in? Like, what do you think a king would how would his vehicle look like? Claire? A chariot. A chariot drives by horses. Oh, yes, definitely. A nice, fancy chariot. Yes, Annalie, what would he drive in? A carriage. A carriage. A really nice carriage. This king was coming in with no crown and no majestic robe, and he was riding a donkey. Now, who knows who that king is? <laughs> Damon, who was it? Jesus. It was Jesus. Why would Jesus choose to come in in a donkey? How would people know that he's the king? If the king is not wearing the proper hat or crown, he's not wearing the proper clothes, and he's not riding the proper ride, <laughs> how do we know that he's the king? How did the people know? Yes. He was the son of God. He was the son of God. That is a perfect answer. But how did the people know? Yes. <laughs> they believed in Jesus. So does that mean that they had heard him before? They had seen him before? They had spent time maybe hearing his stories? It meant that they got to know him. That's how they knew. He wasn't wearing the proper outfit, but people knew because they got to know him. We have a little bit of a challenge because we can't go by the Sea of Galilee and sit down and listen to a wonderful story that Jesus tells us. We can't do that, right? So we have to get to know Jesus a little bit different, right? So how do we get to know Jesus? Annalie. By reading the Bible. Yes, definitely. Reading the Bible or being here, spending time together, having fun learning about Jesus. That's how we get to know him. So our story for today, what I want you to remember is that Jesus doesn't care about the fancy clothes and the fancy chariot. He wants us to love him as our king because we know who he is. Okay? Okay, today there's children's worship, so everybody four to six, go get mommy and daddy so they can walk you there. Everybody older, go back to your parents. It was nice to see you all. Happy Sabbath.
Hi, good morning, church family. At this time, I'd like to invite the deacons to come forth uh, for the collection of the offering. At this time, I'd like to um, convey if we can give um, according to our hearts and how much we've been richly blessed by the good Lord to give a small portion back to him so that we may continue to do his will. And the offering today goes to the conference church building. Please go forth and collect the offering. Please take this offering that we may continue to do your will in all things. Help us to understand that we cannot outgive you, dear Lord, and that you will be in debt to no one, that you will richly bless us in all things continuously. Thank you, dear Lord, for your blessing, your love, your grace, for the gift of your Son, your Spirit, and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
That's special. Well, good morning, church. Uh, now's the time for our congregational prayer. I invite those of you who feel today like you need an extra dose of God's grace in your life uh, to come down to the, fore, uh, to the front and just join me down here. And as, as you come forward, um, the rest of us, let's sing our prayer hymn, hymn number 671. Those of you who are able, uh, please, now is the time to kneel. I invite you, as I pray for us this morning, I invite you to make these words your own. Lord, let me use all things for one sole reason, to find my joy in giving you glory. Therefore, keep me above all things from sin. Keep me from the death of deadly sin which puts hell in my soul. Keep me from the murder of lust that blinds and poisons my heart. Keep me from the sins that eat a man's flesh with irresistible fire until he is devoured. Keep me from loving money in which is hatred, 
from greed and ambition that suffocate my life. Keep me from the dead works of vanity and the thankless labor in which artists destroy themselves for pride and money and reputation, and saints are smothered under the avalanche of their own importunate zeal. Staunch in me the rank wound of covetousness and the hungers that exhaust my nature with their bleeding. Stamp out the serpent envy that stings love with poison and kills all joy. Lord, untie my hands and deliver my heart from sloth. Set me free from the laziness that goes about, disguised as activity when activity is not required of me, and from the cowardice that does what is not demanded in order to escape sacrifice. But give me the strength that waits upon you in silence and peace. Give me humility in which alone is rest, and deliver me from pride which is the heaviest of burdens and possess my whole heart, and possess my whole soul with the simplicity of love. Occupy my whole life with the one thought and the one desire of love, that I may not love for the sake of merit, not for the sake of perfection, not even for the sake of virtue, not for the sake of sanctity, but for you alone. Amen. Today's Gospel reading is found in Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. You may follow the reading on the screens. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you un doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, he sat on it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Well, thank you for the gospel reading. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. Happy Sabbath. You know, all the way back on February 17, we began this sermon series, The Journey to the Cross, and we've invited you in various ways to deepen and renew your commitment to the Lord through uh, fasting and prayer and repentance. And I know that I have seen the fruits of that in my own life, and I know that many of you have uh, as well. Uh, those of you who have participated in our programs on Wednesday night and Friday night uh, have, 
I hope, reap the benefits of, of what we've been doing here. But we've called this the journey to the cross because this, is a t this time of spiritual renewal culminates next Sabbath with Easter weekend, where we remember and celebrate the death and resurrection of the Lord. And so for the past several weeks, we've been looking at these different gospel readings that uh, in one way or another foreshadow or anticipate the cross. You see, all along the way, as Jesus is preaching to the crowds or speaking with his disciples, he is indicating implicitly or sometimes very explicitly the kind of death that he will die. But perhaps what is most important is that the cross is always presented to us as an invitation. The journey to the cross, the journey towards Jerusalem, is one that Jesus invites us to join. So he says, for instance, if anyone would be my disciple, let him take up his cross and follow after me. You see, so the journey to the cross is not something that we watch Jesus do from a distance, but it is a journey in which we join Jesus. Now, this gospel reading this morning, we finally come to this climactic moment. Because Jesus has been saying for so long that we're going to Jerusalem, and there the Son of Man will be betrayed and crucified. And now Jesus has finally arrived. Jerusalem is finally here. But you see, he doesn't come quietly. He enters Jerusalem with this kind of makeshift parade. And I want to ask the question this morning of why is that? And it's because I believe Jesus is inviting us to join in the procession. The journey to the cross is not a path to be traveled alone, but we, the body of Christ, we live this journey uh, again and again. Like pilgrims in the Holy Land, we walk ourselves through these stories year after year so that we, the body, might become more like the head who has gone before us into Jerusalem. He has gone before us into the cross. He has gone ahead of us into death and darkness so that he might forge the path and blaze the trail into eternal life. So now, in our own lives, when we face death and darkness, which we will, we have no need to fear because we don't travel this path alone, but we march triumphantly through the grave because Jesus has gone before us. That's my whole sermon. <laughs> uh, I know that wouldn't be satisfying, so we'll go a little bit longer, but not much longer, okay? Uh, so the, the one thing that I really want to sort of draw out from the gospel reading this morning is uh, when we look at the story, we notice that this celebration, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, didn't just happen spontaneously. Jesus intended for this to happen, and with the help of his disciples, he coordinated it. I think sometimes when we hear or read this story, we might get that impression that this is something that the crowds just of their own accord uh, decided to do. It was this kind of spontaneous celebration. But as we see, the whole thing is, in fact, Jesus' idea. Mark tells us, when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back immediately. So, first of all, the thing to know is the distance between these locations is about a mile and a half, okay? So, Jesus is not sending for transportation because the journey is long and difficult. It's not. He's basically already there. I mean, coming from his hometown in Galilee, I mean, it, you have already arrived. But now he goes and he sends the disciples forward to fetch this colt. And 
this exchange that he tells the disciples to have is, I think, very telling. If someone asks you what you're doing, just tell them the Lord needs it and we'll be coming back this way immediately. What effect do you suppose that would have? You think that would pique people's curiosity? You think friends and neighbors might start kind of poking their heads out to see who it is that is uh, claiming to uh, be the Lord proceeding into Jerusalem? So Jesus, I think, very intentionally, quite clearly, is creating a bit of a scene. He is orchestrating this event. But most provocative of all is what he sends for. Not a war horse or a stallion, but the foal of a donkey, as some of the evangelists will put it. This story is often referred to as the triumphal entry, but as even our children's story this morning pointed out, I hope you realize the irony in the story is that this is the most untriumphal entry you could possibly imagine. His coming in on a donkey like this is intentionally comedic because it's the exact opposite of what you would expect from anyone who's taking themselves seriously. You see, Jesus doesn't come in with a sign of strength, but precisely with a sign of weakness. And I think the early Christians understood the subtext of this passage um, because we see even in the earliest works of Christian art, when this scene is pictured, uh, Jesus is often depicted as riding side saddle, which is something that would happen either uh, for someone who has been injured or perhaps a woman. It's the opposite of what you would expect from an emperor or a warrior. Jesus is not coming in strength, but the Christians understand that this scene is a manifestation of God's uh, weakness. So this whole scene, I believe, can and should be read as a kind of political satire. Because Pilate or Caesar would be riding in with a war horse and chariots and soldiers with their weapons, but Jesus comes in on a baby donkey with peasants and farmers waving sticks and branches. The whole thing is a, is a joke, and it's supposed to be a joke. It's a mockery of military power. Because, you see, in the Hebrew Bible, God, time and time again, tells the people of Israel not to trust in horses, not to trust in chariots or swords or spears or bows and arrows. 500 years prior to this, 500 years before Christ, the prophet Zechariah wrote these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, the prophet Zechariah understood and foretold that the king that God had chosen will not come to you with a show of strength and power, but humbly riding on a donkey. So he goes on to write, he, that is this king on a donkey, will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This humble and non-violent king, the prophet says, will destroy the power of the chariot and the war horse. This king will break the battle bow and he will bring peace to the whole world. This untriumphal entry is a way of expressing or demonstrating that God's way of peace triumphs over violence. It's not weapons of war, but love itself that conquers the world. And we, when we can see this Palm Sunday procession in this light as a celebration of weakness and foolishness and poverty, then we can see 
that this scene itself is a foreshadowing of the cross. Because, again, I think we might have a tendency to be sort of puzzled by the events of Holy Week. How is it that Jesus can be so popular on one day and the very next he is being handed over to be crucified? But if we understand this story properly, we realize that the triumphal entry and the crucifixion have at their center the very same point. The same point that runs throughout the gospel, what lies at the heart of Christianity. The Bible expresses it in different ways, but the point is always the same. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. The first will be last, and the last will be first. All of these sayings from Scripture summarize that most basic and elemental idea of Christianity. It's what Paul refers to as the message of the cross. He puts it to the Corinthians this way. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He goes on to say, Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, the things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. And you see, this is where it all becomes very practical. Because God delights in using the weak and the poor and the powerless. So the paradoxical advice given by Jesus is this. Whoever wishes to be great among you must become your servant. And whoever would be first must become your slave. So this morning I plead with you as Paul pleaded with the Ephesians to put away from yourselves all bitterness and wrath and anger, wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. The more we give way to rivalry and envy and competition, the more our lives will be lost. The harder we fight to climb to the top, the faster we'll find ourselves on the bottom. The key to happiness, the key to a life of joy and peace and fulfillment is to live a life in service to others. And every time the church comes together in worship, we remind ourselves of this and we reorient our lives to correspond to God's upside-down kingdom. Because after all, what is it that we do here every week? What is it that we do week after week? And what is it that Christians have been doing for thousands of years? But when we come together, we sing songs of praise and worship to a man who was hung on a tree and left for dead. Nothing could be more absurd and foolish on the face of it. And that's just the way God would have it. Because therein lies the genius of Christianity. God opposes the proud, but he lifts up the humble. And so if you want to be close to God, don't put your trust in wealth. Don't defend yourself with weapons. Don't rely on your own strength in life. Instead, you must learn to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So we join with this festive procession, those who spread their cloaks on the road and those who spread palm branches that they had cut in the fields. 
And with them we call out, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So I invite you to raise your voice in praise to Jesus, this servant king, as we sing our closing hymn, hymn number 230, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen.